Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains saying howdy there, pilgrim. And today, I am still getting over my bout of COVID, so excuse me if I sound a little still under the weather, trying to power through it. And we're going to discuss, well, not the thing that I thought I was going to discuss, actually. I was actually asked to talk about the Battle of Castle Itter, which is an incident during World War II where American soldiers teamed up with German soldiers, which sounds weird already. And it is a very interesting story, that's true. But, two things. That story's been told a lot by other people on YouTube, and what I didn't realize until I was researching it is that there was one other incident where the Americans teamed up with the Germans during World War II. So we're gonna talk about that one instead, because that's way more interesting to me as someone who prefers more obscure stuff. So we're gonna discuss Operation Cowboy, where the Americans teamed up with the Germans to rescue some horses. Yes, really. Not making it up. Now, first things first, why on earth would the Americans team up with the Germans? The Germans were our enemy, right? Well, yes, but it's more complicated than that. See, among the regular German armed forces, the Wehrmacht, not all of them were necessarily on board with the whole Nazi thing. They were soldiers, and their country was at war, so they fought for their country, but not every single one of them was necessarily in full agreement with Nazi ideology, nor were they aware of the horrific things that the Nazi party was doing behind closed doors. It wasn't until the final weeks of the war, as well as afterwards, that many of them realized the full scale of the horrors that were committed by the administration. However, there was a separate secret police slash military force that was full tilt into the whole Nazi thing. The SS, or Schutzstaffel. The Waffen-SS were their combat branch, and they were fully committed Nazis. Fully in line with the ideology, and were the ones mostly responsible for doing the horrible things that we generally attribute to that war whereas the regular Wehrmacht soldiers were fighting on the front lines, doing the traditional war stuff, and generally fighting under the rules of war and with some level of honor and dignity, the Waffen-SS operated mostly behind the scenes and tended to make innocent people that the Nazis deemed unfit for life disappear. I bring all this up because it's very important for the story. During the tail end of the European conflict, the Wehrmacht armed forces were pretty much convinced that it was over, and they were right. There was no way that any kind of counterattack or pushback was going to do anything about the Allied advance. The Soviets were pushing hard from the east, and the rest of the Allies were pushing hard from the west. They were being sandwiched in between two unstoppable forces. But the administration wouldn't give up. They truly believed in their ideology, and they believed in their superiority. Even though for anyone with a brain, it was clear that it was over. The Waffen-SS were still fighting, though. Fully committed Nazis. But the Wehrmacht were a bit more chaotic in terms of their commitment to the cause. Many should have deserted or found a way to surrender to the Allies, specifically the Americans. The reason for this is that the Americans were known to be a lot more courteous to their POWs. They would allow them to surrender under the rules of war, take them in, and many German soldiers actually found their treatment as POWs to be quite pleasant, all things considered. They were given basic anemones and just held until the end of the conflict. It was a lot different than being captured by, say, the Soviets. The Soviets were not nice at all, and they had general reason to be. Germany had invaded them and done horrific things during the invasion. The Soviets were out for revenge. And another consistent issue that the rest of the Allies were noticing, that the Soviets, under Stalin, weren't really liberating the territories that they were taking over, more as just occupying them and taking them into the Soviet Communist envelope, which as I'm sure many of you know would eventually lead to the Iron Curtain and the Cold War. But that's for later. The point is, a lot of the German armed forces were trying in vain to surrender, but they didn't want to surrender to the East, they wanted to surrender to the West. And that brings us to the horses, Lipizzans. Lipizzans, or Lipizzaners, are a very specific horse breed. It's named for the Lipizza stud, of the Habsburg monarchy of Austria. They're closely associated with the Spanish riding school, 
which is in Vienna, Austria, which I don't what it's but it's Spanish. I don't well, why ugh, horses. Anyway, this particular breed of horses are known for their beauty and for being rather rare. There are not that many of them. And they're show horses. They're very desirable. And, more importantly, they're innocent. What doesn't get talked about many times during world conflicts like this is the impact it has on the wildlife, or animals in general. Animals, domesticated or otherwise, suffer greatly in times of war. And these horses were at the Spanish Riding School in Austria until Germany annexed them in 1938. The mares from the school were then taken by the Nazis to a special stud farm in Hasto, Czechoslovakia. The performing stallions actually stayed in Vienna. The reason they took the mares was that they were creating a breeding program to try and create an Aryan horse, which would sound way too ridiculous in any other context, but given which political faction we're talking about in this story, I fully believe that, without question. The mares remained in Czechoslovakia all through the war. That was until April of 1945. Germany's loss, like I said, was in sight to anybody with a brain, and at that point, 20 miles west of Hasto, sat General George Patton's U.S. Third Army. They were waiting for orders to liberate Prague, and more alarmingly, 40 miles east of Hasto, sat the Red Army, creeping forward to bring the whole of Czechoslovakia under the Soviets' political influence. At the time, the horses were actually being cared for by Wehrmacht, regular German military, veterinary officers, and they were really worried about their horses. They'd grown fond of them over the years, and the horses hadn't done anything wrong. Like I said, they're just innocent creatures. The vets were terrified that if the Red Army arrived first, they might seize the horses and use them for whatever they wanted. They didn't really trust the Soviets would necessarily care that they were a rare breed. They would use them as beasts of burden, or perhaps as food, or just kill them outright. The Soviets were already known to have destroyed the Royal Hungarian Lippenzanners. They wound up shooting many of the horses rather than taking care of them, and the survivors were used just like regular horses to pull carts around. At the farm, at that time, there was a Luftwaffe intelligence officer named Colonel Halters. His unit had been stranded there after running out of fuel. Halters liked horses, and he had become close friends with the commander on that farm, whose name was Rudovsky. Alters was the one to suggest and convince Rudovsky to surrender the collection of horses, along with his men, to the Americans before the Soviets could reach the town. Rudovsky was hesitant because he was mindful of his oath to the Fatherland, to resist at all costs, but Halters really didn't care about any of that, and he secretly set out to negotiate the surrender of the horses to the Americans by himself. Halters would eventually approach the 42nd Cavalry Reconnaissance Squadron, who were part of the 2nd Cavalry Group on the American side, operating under Patton. Mind you, they were called Cavalry, but by this point in the war, they were mechanized. Although some of their members did have experience with horses. And this included their commander, Colonel Charles M. Reed. Holters negotiated and laid the groundwork for the surrender. He managed to persuade a veterinarian from the farm to cross the lines under a flag of truce and work out the logistics of moving several hundred priceless horses safely through the middle of a war zone. Word of this plan was sent back to the German Commandant, and he agreed to the move. Reed was actually ecstatic about this idea, but he had to contact and get full permission from Patton. Patton, however, did recognize the importance of the horses to European culture, and he gave his approval for the plan, but on kind of a shoestring budget. It had to be quick, and it had to be with a minimal force. He didn't have the luxury of expending his entire army just to rescue the horses. They were still fighting loyal Germans at the time, and many of those were not actually aware of this particular plan to save these horses, thus would absolutely shoot the U.S. forces who were trying to get into Czechoslovakia. Didn't help that the men of the 47th Cavalry were absolutely frickin' exhausted, as were most of the American forces by that point. Oh, yeah, since they were on a stud farm, many of the horses were actually pregnant, and others had just given birth. So that would make things a lot more awkward, too. And they knew that the Red Army was at most a few days away, but they may have only even had a few hours. They couldn't be sure. Patton ordered that the commanding officer of the 42nd was to provide two small cavalry reconnaissance troops and some armor, for a 20-mile push into German-occupied territory. The commander of this task force, named Major Andrews, 
was given only 325 men to enter an area that was perhaps defended by tens of thousands of German troops. And this included at least two Panzer divisions. The task force had some machine gun armed jeeps and M8 armored cars, but besides them, the heaviest armor they had were five M24 Chaffee light tanks. And these were quite outclassed by German Panther tanks that were known to be operating in the area. If they ran into them, they'd be in a whole heap of trouble. They also had a pair of howitzer motor carriages and some artillery guns mounted on the light tank chassis. It really wasn't a formidable task force, but it was what they had to work with. Operating under the name Task Force Andrews, they set off as an artillery barrage blew a hole in the forward German defenses. Their advance was actually contested pretty much every time they reached a village, but the force actually pressed on and managed to reach the stud farm, as well as the horses. You're probably wondering, wait, well, when did the Americans team up with the Germans? I mean, I know they surrendered the horses to them, but this isn't really the same team up as the Battle of Castle Litter, is it? Well, hold on a second. When they reached the farm, Colonel Reed started seeking out vehicles to move the pregnant mares, as well as the newborn fowls, away from the area. Andrews turned over the task force to his deputy, Captain Thomas M. Stewart. By this point, the force was reduced to one cavalry troop, two tanks, and two howitzer motor carriages, with a total of only 180 men. This is a problem because he didn't actually have enough to secure the farm at all, not to mention the town, as well as the road back to U.S. lines. He needed to recruit some extra manpower. First, he turned to a small group of Allied POWs that had been liberated with the horses. These men included British, New Zealanders, French, Poles, and Serbs. They'd been used as laborers on the farm by the Germans. The men were apparently actually excited to be rearmed in the situation and agreed to help out and given captured German weapons. But even with them, it still wasn't going to be enough. So then Stuart turned to some anti-communist Russian Cossacks that were in the area. They were commanded by a former prince, believe it or not, Prince Amasov. He and his Cossacks had actually been on the German side during the war because they hated the Soviets. But when the Germans started losing, they conveniently deserted and were just kind of chucking around until they could find a way to slip past Soviet lines and go home. But Cossacks were known to be excellent horsemen, and they were. And when they heard about the plan to save the horses, the prince and his men were actually eager to help, so they were rearmed as well. This still wasn't enough. So Stuart finally decided, okay, well, you all wanted us to help the horses. Hey, Germans. He asked Colonel Rudovsky for some of his own men to join the defense of the horses. Stuart agreed to rearm them if they pledged to serve under US authority. Since many of these Germans had wanted to save these horses anyway, and they were eager to avoid getting captured by the Soviets, and they really didn't even like the Nazis anymore, if they ever did, they were absolutely willing to help. So now we have this ridiculous ragtag force that became known as Stuart's Ford and Legion, consisting of Americans, British, New Zealanders, French, Poles, Serbs, Russian Cossacks, oh, and Germans, all working together during World War II, and all for the safety of horses. The story is insane, but everyone wound up working well together in kind of a joyous bit of unity in the bloodiest conflict in world history. Like I mentioned before, the regular Germans were a lot different than the SS, but SS troops were converging on Hosto because they knew the Americans were there, and they were determined to get those horses for the German Reich. SS Regiment Deutschland made an assault on the farm, which consisted of two battles. Several Americans were actually killed or injured in the fighting, while more than 100 enemy soldiers of the SS wound up dying, with an equal number of them wounded. The SS actually might have been able to overpower the defenders of the farm if they had possessed armor, but this particular regiment did not. They had no tanks at all, so Stuart's Foreign Legion was able to push them back every time, and during a break in the action, Colonel Reed finally managed to organize the transport to get the horses out of Esto and back to U.S. lines. The stallions that were on the farm were actually ridden out by American, German, and Cossack officers, all of which knew how to ride horseback. Some of the mares were driven on the hoof like a true cowboy roundup, and those that were pregnant or with their foals were loaded onto German and American trucks and sent along that way. Their timing couldn't have been better and more at the last minute. 
as as they were making their way out of Hasto, Soviet T-34 tanks appeared on the eastern edge of the town. The Red Army did spot what the Americans were doing, but since they were currently still operating on the same side, they didn't really have any authority to question it, and they let them go. The horses managed to reach safety behind United States lines, and as the war drew to a close, and Europe tried to get back to some sense of normalcy, which would take years, the horses were eventually returned to the Spanish Riding School in Austria, where their descendants remain and still perform to this day. Colonel Reed himself would later be quoted as saying about the operation, We just wanted to do something beautiful. And it makes sense, his men had been through, well, hell and back, when they were given the opportunity and the request, pleading with them to save a group of innocent creatures that had nothing to do with this horrible conflict, how could they have said no? Not only did saving the horses just seem like the right thing to do, but it supplied a unique opportunity for unity beyond national lines. It was something the world very desperately needed in that time, and to be honest, something we might even need right now. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Sundu 267, Orange Glass, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hawk 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, Lock Kraken, Twin Fox, Dimeblade 17, and Anzac A1. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.